All right. Now, as I mentioned in the announcements, the sermon I'm preaching tonight actually was a, is a subject that was covered at the preaching class yesterday, which is great because for the past month, I've been kind of wanting to preach a sermon regarding Calvinism. Calvinism is a really, it's a really dangerous, wicked, do it's not even just one doctrine, it's this whole kind of way of interpreting scriptures. I mean, it, it's, a, it's not just one little thing. It's like, it, it, it's, it's a big package deal. And uh, of course, Calvinism is named after John Calvin. And um, oftentimes when you get into this subject, the, <laughs> as with many false doctrines, if you try to listen to someone who believes in Calvinism, it sounds very confusing. There's some things that they'll say that sound, okay, yeah, I think I agree with that. That sounds right. But then as you keep going, it, 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 the, the, the waters get muddied and things just don't seem very clear. And just on a broad scale, when you, hear, when you hear doctrine, you're listening to preaching, and it just sounds really confusing, it's probably false. It's probably not right. Because the doctrines in Scripture, by and large, are very simple to understand, especially key doctrines. I mean, we're talking about salvation, we're talking about things that are just, I mean, milk of the word, bread and butter. But what Calvinism does, they come in and they, they make the simple things of God extremely complicated. And they muddy it and, and, and they do all of this manipulation and they try to enforce their logic and understanding on things, oftentimes which just isn't in Scripture at all. And they're trying to make things fit together into a certain view. Now, because of the nature of Calvinism, I have, I have a tendency to find a lot of sermons boring on Calvinism because <laughs> the doctrine is just, it, it's kind of hard to follow even their way of thinking. And I don't really like leading people down that path of, of thinking the way that they do about this stuff because it kind of can, can just mess with your understanding of scriptures in general when you're just hearing too much false doctrine. Then, and, and oftentimes it'll be on passages that may be a little bit harder to understand. And you start thinking along those paths and, and it really can just mess you up. So but I'm glad that, that Brother Mark preached that sermon yesterday though because he made a point that I don't think I've ever made in any of the sermons that I've ever preached on Calvinism. And it's a very simple point. And it's something that I think completely destroys the whole foundation of Calvinism and the Calvinistic doctrine. And it's actually one that's very simple to make. So before I get into that point, and I'm going to spend the whole sermon just on that one point, Calvinism is a, is a doctrine, they, they use an acronym, they use the word TULIP as, to kind of define the five core principles that, that make up Calvinism. So each letter of the word means something. So T means total depravity of man. U means unconditional election. L means limited atonement. I means irresistible grace. And P means perseverance of the saints. So these are the five core tenets of their doctrine. So total depravity means that man is totally depraved, right, as a sinner from birth. Because Adam sinned, the moment you're born, you are just completely, 100%, totally depraved, incapable of doing anything good at all. And the only way that a person can get saved is if God actually gives you the ability and the grace to believe on him. So what they'll say, and this is the, this is the subject that I'm really going to be hitting on this evening, because it, it completely destroys, like, like it, it doesn't make any sense and it flies in the face of scripture. But what they're saying is that, you know, we, here we believe 
that man has a will, a free will to be able to decide what we believe. And that even though we may be a sinner, we don't have a regenerated spirit within us. We can still hear the gospel. The gospel has power to convince us that it's true and that it's right. But we ultimately make that choice of putting our faith in the gospel. Now, Calvinism teaches that they have a problem with us saying that because they'll say, well, you can't do any good thing on your own and believing the gospel is a good thing. That you just, you just don't have the ability to even put your faith on that, that you could only do that if God gives you that ability. And this comes from them putting too much logic and, and, and not just too much logic. Logic isn't a bad thing. You know, I want to you know, I, I be careful not to just throw around like logic as if, as if logic itself is bad. Logic becomes bad, though, when you have false premises, when you have false beginnings and false starting points or, or when you're using bad logic, right? Logic that doesn't make sense. You know, making uh, points, you know, from point A to point B that just perfectly makes sense and using logic appropriately, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But they use, it's kind of like man-made wisdom on top of God's word and make some presuppositions and some assumptions into God's word. And they, and they, they take some, some verses farther than they ought to be applied. Okay. And I know I'm speaking kind of in general terms, but I really want to dig into this one point. I don't want to get into all of, of Calvinism, but this total depravity thing is, is a key element to their doctrine. And it basically is stating that with, you know, you are incapable of even believing on Jesus Christ. God has to give you the gift of being able to do that. And since God chooses who is saved and who isn't, he gives certain people that ability and certain people not. And the I, remember the I and tulip is irresistible grace. And what that means is that once a person is given the grace to believe, they're being called, they will believe just automatically. Everybody who God chooses receive this ability to believe the gospel. And as soon as then they hear it, once they've been given that ability, they, they automatically will just believe it because it's irresistible. Here's what means you cannot resist God's grace. Which is funny because we actually have scripture, and this isn't in my notes, but in the book of Acts, uh, I forget what chapter it is, there's a story where it says, you know, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. And I don't remember if that was when Stephen was preaching his sermon or if that was with the Apostle Paul, but um, he says you always resist. Well, if it's irresistible grace, how can you resist the Holy Ghost? But see, that's just one very clear example of something that just says, okay, Calvinism has to be false on that point. But that's a core tenet that says, nope, it's irresistible. Once God is calling you or pulling you, you cannot refuse it. You will get saved. Bottom line, because God's sovereign, because God's all power. God can do whatever he wants. Yeah, God is all powerful, but he puts limitations on himself. I mean, just because God's all powerful doesn't mean he could go around telling lies. If he did that, he wouldn't be holy. But see, holy is a character, characteristic of God. It's, it's a restriction, you can say, if you will, I mean, if you want to call it a restriction, that God has on himself. I mean, it's just part of who he is. He's always, he can't tell a lie. And in the same manner, he's created us for a specific purpose and reason, but he's also given us the ability to choose. And he's not going to overstep that boundary. He's going to do things the way that he has them laid out. And he gives us the choice. Now, those two, and, and everything goes hand in hand. I've heard people say, well, I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I'm a two-point Calvinist or a three-point Calvinist or whatever. That means they believe some of it, not all of it. They haven't thought it all the way through 
because they all rely on each other in order to fit together. And with any false doctrine, you're going to find when you start tampering with any area of Scripture, because everything is so interwoven so perfectly in God's Word, you're going to end up finding problems in other areas. One doctrine that you mess with is going to start causing a ripple effect and saying, oh, well, now i got to tweak what I believe here and now over here and now over here. And, and it has a, a, a really big impact. And that's why they have things like, and that's why, you know, even believing in something like the pre-trib rapture, you can't just believe in that alone. You also have to go hand in hand with that is believing that the Jews are God's elect and that they're a special race and they're a special people because you have to deal with verses in the Bible that say, after the tribulation of those days, so sun be dark and moon shall not give your light. You know, what do you do with that? Oh, well, if that's talking to a different group of people, now we can, now we can make everything fit together, right? And, and it's their, their, their way of trying to make all the scripture fit. It has to start going off and having other impact in other scriptures. Calvinism is no different. Um, they believe that humans are incapable of believing on Christ, and because you're spiritually dead, you cannot respond to the gospel unless God grants you regeneration. Now, I'm going to use some terms here today that you may not have ever even really given much thought to because there's no reason for you to when you just believe the Bible at face value and just kind of understand what it says. But they are very particular in the words that they use. And they'll be like, no, 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 you're misrepresenting what we believe. And, all this, you know, and, and they'll have um, all different, I mean, very, very particular words that they use. And one of the words that you'll find that they use is, is regeneration. So they believe you cannot respond to the gospel unless God grants you regeneration to then automatically believe the gospel and then you begin to have good works. And, and these things all happen in their specific order. And regeneration, what they, what they teach, and, and I've looked at, at multiple teachers in, you know, of, of Calvinism, even John Calvin himself, well, um, it's, it's being born again. And they say that that happens before you can put faith in Jesus Christ. You heard that right. That's, that is when you nail it down, when you're nailing down what they believe. Because at first, it does, I've heard this for a long time, that, well, God gives you the ability to believe that even that, even that isn't of your own will. It's not of anything that you could have chosen. God had to give that to you. But when you really start breaking down what they say by that and what they mean by that, that then means if God's given that to you, well, you could only make that choice by having the Spirit of God. Because that's what they're saying. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. So they take a verse like that, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, and say, well, see, you can't receive the gospel because you're a natural man. Therefore, you have to have the Spirit in order to receive the things of God, which would be believing or putting faith in the gospel. See, now you put the cart before the horse. And there are so many scriptures that will refute that easily. I mean, everyone's not ready to be like, yeah, you probably have about five or six coming to mind right now about you believe first <laughs> and then you receive the spirit and then you are born again. And then, you know, and we could go on and on on the scriptures. But one thing I want to do, I'm going to I'm going to do an exercise tonight in going through what these people believe. Because if you come across things, if you read, if you go online, if you, if, you, if you hear doctrine, one of the things that you'll notice, if you haven't already, and I have, I have you're not going to probably be able to see this here, but I went online to find some people who are, who are good at articulating this belief, this Calvinistic belief. And this person, John Hendricks, I'm going to read this to you in a minute. But one of the things that they always like to do, and you'll see this on, even on um, statements of faith on websites and stuff, they'll make a statement, and then in parentheses, they'll have all of these references, right? Don't ever, ever accept a statement that just has all of these references after it 
just because they have all these references after it. Too many people are lazy and just think, oh, wow, well, if there's that many references to it, it must be true. Instead of opening it up and going, okay, let's look at this reference and see, does this say what you say it says? Does this support what you actually believe? And if you're going to take the time and the effort to, to, to hear what someone else might have to say about doctrine, don't ever just skip over that and just allow that, to, unless you already can say, well, I know that's false, right? If you could say that, then fine, right? You say, I don't, I don't even need to look it up because I already know that that's false. But if you're, if you're considering anything, you're looking at a statement of faith or whatever, look them up. Is that really what it says? Especially if you start questioning, I don't know if that doesn't sound right to me. Look them up. And we're going to go through that exercise today. But I'm going to read you what they believe. I'm not making this stuff up. And I'm going to try to be fair and not say, you know, because they always look like, you're not representing Calvinism properly. No, we are representing Calvinism properly. They just don't like the outcome. They just don't like the way that it sounds when I say it. Because it makes them sound stupid. Because it is stupid. Because it doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't line up with Scripture. No matter how much they get blue in the face and, and want to, you know, tell you that, no, 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 you're just not getting it. No, I do get it. You just don't understand the Bible. And it's usually because they're not saved. Because believing in a God that picks and chooses based on nothing other than a whim of just whatever God wants, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell by my divine will, that is not the God of the Bible. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the Bible says about God. That's the heart of the Lord. God wants people to be saved and be with him. If that's his will, and see, according to Calvinism, you know, God's sovereign, then that would mean everybody's going to heaven. Because if everything always happens according to God's will, then everybody would be saved and go to heaven because that is the will of God. But see, not everything happens according to God's will on this earth because he has allowed us to make choices. Are there times when God intervenes? Yes. Are there times when miracles happen, God steps in, God protects people? Yes. But is God a great grand puppet master pulling the strings of every single action that you do no matter what you ate this morning, you know what? God made you do that. No matter what you did or said, the, the pedophile that goes out and, and, and defiles a child, yep, God did that. No. That's a perverted, twisted, sick God that doesn't exist. But that is the God of Calvinism. I'm going to read you part of an article from R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul is a big Calvinist. Okay, maybe you may or may not know who this person is. Uh, he's, he's written books and, and is kind of a, a big name. And he's going to, he calls, he's going to, I'm just going to read this for you. Again, from his own, his, his own mouth, his own words, right? A monergistic work is a work produced singly by one person. And you also notice, if you're, if you're looking up any type of Calvin, Calvinistic doctrine, they love the theological terms. I mean, they just, they thrive on it. And it's a, it's a when you deal with, with the Calvinists, especially ones who are real serious about it, you're going to find yourself dealing with a lot of very proud people. Very proud, very lifted up, very full of themselves, and they exalt their, their intelligence and they think that they're so smart. And that's why they understand this and you don't. Because they're so much smarter than you. Well, in the Greek, you know, apostasia says, you know, it's, it, and they'll just go off on their tangents. On, they don't know Greek. They just read that somewhere. They read some commentary by someone. They might read a lot of books, but they're not reading a lot of Bible. 
and they're able to repeat different arguments from different people, whatever. And they like using these words, monergistic. Monergistic, because that's something that you normally would use in conversation with someone or you're trying to explain a doctrine, right? A monergistic work is a work produced singly. At least R.C. Sproul is trying to explain what this is. But this is something that you'll find throughout Calvinistic teachings and papers and stuff, and they'll just throw it out there as if everybody just knows what this word is, or you should know, and if you don't, you're stupid, and whatever. Monergistic work is a work produced singly by one person. The prefix mono means one. The word erg refers to a unit of work. Words like energy are built upon this root. A synergistic work is one that involves cooperation between two or more persons or things. The prefix syn, S-Y-N, means together with. I labor this distinction for a reason. The debate between Rome and Luther hung on this single point. At issue was this, is regeneration a monergistic work of God or a synergistic work that requires cooperation between man and God? And he's, he's recounting this story. He went to seminary, went to some Bible college, and his professor wrote, regeneration precedes faith on the board. And R.C. Sproul, when he saw that, was just like, he was floored. He even said, by his own admission, he was just like, what in the world are you talking about? Because that is the proper reaction that anyone should have that believes the Bible Regeneration precedes, it means it comes before faith? You mean I could be regenerated before I even believe? How does that happen? When my professor wrote, regeneration precedes faith on the blackboard, he was clearly siding with the monergistic answer. After a person is regenerated, that person cooperates by exercising faith and trust. But the first step is the work of God and of God alone. You're saying God does the work all by himself to say you are regenerated. Then you can have the faith to put the faith on Jesus Christ. And he continues on here. He says the reason we do not cooperate with regenerating grace before it acts upon us and in us is because we cannot. We cannot because we are spiritually dead we can no more assist the Holy Spirit in the quickening of our souls to spiritual life than Lazarus could help Jesus raise him from the dead. And I'm going to get into that Lazarus example because that's one they really love to use. And see, they'll take the example of Lazarus when Jesus called forth, Lazarus, come forth, right? After he was dead for four days and then he came forth. They say that that is a picture of salvation, and I say no. And I'm going to get into that later. I'll explain what I believe that is. It actually makes perfect sense. But what, the reason why they like to use that example is because they say, well, Lazarus was dead in the grave. Right? And if Jesus was just saying the words, Lazarus come forth, and he's just dead, right, without a miracle, without something happening for him to be brought alive, he's just going to lay there. He's dead. He can't hear anything. He can't do anything. Right? I mean, anyone could be yelling at a dead body and it's not going to do anything. Their point that they're trying to make is that, well, I mean, he had to be brought to life first in order to hear and then come out of the grave and respond to Jesus Christ's calling. You see where they get that? I mean, you could see it, right? You could see this is what they're using, but this is how they distort and twist Scripture, tying meaning into things that's not there. And this becomes their great example of trying to explain to people how this works. And if you're simple-minded, if you don't, or let me just say this, and, and not even just in a bad way. I, I don't mean if you're simple-minded in a bad way. But like If you're simple concerning Scripture, you could have already been saved, you believe the Bible, and then you hear something like that, and you're just like, oh, well, I guess that kind of makes sense. You know, and you're, and you're just kind of being duped. I can see that happening. But the more you read Scripture and the more you've just, just read the Bible and you see faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You see, you, know, you, you, you see, <laughs> what must I do to be saved? Believe it, you know, like all these different things. And again, I'm quoting verses now that they're going to say, oh, but see, that's being saved. That's different than being regenerated. And that's different than being in Christ. And that's different. And they have all these distinctions 
that you would look at normally and just be like, no, it's actually talking about the same thing. Being born again is being saved, is being in Christ. You know, these things all refer to the same exact state of being. But they'll, they'll try to separate it all up. So I'm going to read you now from John Hendricks. I'm just, I'm just getting this out here to start off with of, this is what they believe. I mean, this is coming out of their mouth. And this isn't something that's specific to R.C. Sproul. This is something that's specific to Calvinism because that's the doctrine they espouse and hold to. And it's not just his own thing or his own spinoff of, of John Calvin's writings. I only have these two because I don't want to spend any, give them any more time than necessary. I could, we could go through and get quote after quote after quote from all kinds of different people. That's not what matters. Uh, I'm going to read this, this quote from an article from John Hendricks. The gospel declares that repentance and faith, in parentheses, commands of God, are themselves God's working in us the desire both to will and to do. And he has a couple references there. And not something that the sinner himself contributes towards the price of his salvation. Repentance and faith can only be exercised by a soul after and in immediate consequence of its regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So in repentance and faith come after the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. And here's where you get, I mean, that's a big statement, big claim to make, right? And he knows that that's a big claim to make. So this is why he has, in parentheses, 1 John 5, 1, 10, Acts 16, 14, Acts 13, 48, John 10, 24 to 26, Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, John 6, 37, John 1, 13, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, James 1, 17, John 3, 27, 1 Peter 1, 3. You're like, wow. Well, that must be a lot of evidence, right? Well, we'll find out because we're actually, I'm going to finish what he wrote here. And we're going to go through every single one of those verses. And see, does any of them back up what he's claiming that regeneration comes first and then faith? Regeneration meaning born again. <laughs> he says, God regenerates and we, in the exercise of the new gracious ability given, repent. God disarms the opposition of the human heart, subduing the hostility of the carnal mind, and with irresistible power draws his chosen ones to Christ. The gospel confesses we love him because he first loved us. Whereas before we had no desire for God, but now God's regenerating grace gives us the desire, willingness, and delight in his person and commands that infallibly gives rise to faith. Faith and works are both the evidences of the new birth, not the cause of it. This is clearly indicated in the following text from the scripture. And of course, they're, they're quoting a, a, a corrupt version of the Bible. Anyways, everyone who believes that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And this is another reason why the version that you read matters because you can't come to this conclusion using the King James Version. And actually, we started off in 1 John 5, right? This is what he's quoting. So you can look down in verse number 1 of 1 John chapter 5. I'll read this for you again. What he is quoting is 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is a Christ has been born of God. And obviously the spin that he's trying to put on that is everyone that believes, so when you believe, you've already been born of God. That's what he's trying to make the claim that that verse says. What does the verse in the Bible say? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. It doesn't say they've already been born of God. It says whosoever believes, they're born of God. And it's, it, that's very simple, right? Is there any question in what that's saying? Just say, hey, raise your hand if you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Okay? Well, guess what? You're born of God. That's all that means. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're born of God. 
There's no timing in that at all. I mean, that's just saying, if you believe you're born of God. But they're using this already as, as, a, as a proof text. And see, you get this from these false versions. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And you can, and you can manipulate and twist the language. And even that on its surface, you wouldn't necessarily get that understanding of the words, but you can see how they can make it sound that way. And again, just all the more importance of why every word matters. Every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God matters. And when they start saying different things, and, and, uh, and you know what? If you were to compare the Bible versions just side by side and you just came to this verse, you might not even think that that's that big of a deal. Like, well, it's basically saying the same thing. Until someone comes out with stuff like this. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. That's not what that's saying at all. And then he continues to quote here, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony of God in himself. And we know, it's jumping around, just so you know, from verse 1 to verse 10 to verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. So this is the start of his, you know, all of these verses that supposedly uphold the doctrine that no, 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 you get saved, you get born again first, you get regenerated, and then you, and then you can believe. Well, let's look what 1 John chapter 5 says. We already looked into verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also is begotten of him. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Again, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. It doesn't say you have to have the witness in yourself before you can believe. It just says everyone that believes, he that believeth, you have the witness in yourself. It's a, it's a, it's a clear statement of fact, not giving any order of events. Just a statement of fact, what the scripture says. 1 John 5, 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And again, we're seeing here the, that the Bible is just simply stating that we know the Son of God has come, He's given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. Now, when you get saved, you don't know everything about God, right? I mean, you come to Jesus in faith and understand that he paid for your sins, but you don't know everything about God. But then when you're saved and when you get the Spirit, now you can know him that is true and, and get to know more and understand and comprehend and really develop and grow and learn more, right? That you wouldn't otherwise be able to because there is a distinction. There, there, are, there are verses that say it is a truth that the natural man receiveth not the things of God and that, and that the God's word is spiritually discerned and that we do need to be saved to understand the scripture. But see, there's a difference between understanding all these great truths of the Bible and just getting saved. God has given that ability of just being able to understand the gospel because it's not difficult. It's not complicated. It's something that is very easily understood. Uh, flip back over to Acts chapter 16. This is one of the references that was given to support the claim that regeneration happens first and then belief. Acts chapter 16 Verse number 13 is where we're going to start. Now, some of these I'm going to provide a little bit more context than what he references, which, again, is another very important thing to remember, that just because someone references maybe one verse, read before that verse and read after that verse to get the full context of what is being said. Because context means everything. I mean, it really does have a big impact on what, what particular verse means based on the context it's given in, right? 
Acts 16, verse number 13, the Bible says, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. So here we, again, this is a story of a woman that was out ready to pray. God touched her heart. Okay. Does this say that she had to, you know, God had to touch her heart or open up her heart in order for her to receive the gospel? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Does it say that she's regenerated at this moment? I mean, even if you want to say, because a lot of people say, well, you know, no man could come unto, unto God unless he call you, unless he draw you, right? Which I don't have some huge problem with that, but I would just say that God's calling all men to repentance. Jesus Christ said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Was Jesus Christ lifted up from the earth? Yeah, he was when he was crucified on the cross. They literally lifted him up from the earth, and that's what he was referring to as his crucifixion. So he is drawing all men unto him. So like I said, I don't really have, I don't have a problem with that. I think God is trying to compel us and draw us to, to believe. But you know what this verse doesn't say? It doesn't say that she was regenerated at this moment or at any moment or that this was even a, you know, necessary, just something that happened. It's a statement of fact. It's not some clear statement. And we've got to be careful not to just make these, these doctrines on some events of some story that happened as opposed to clear scripture. Because we have plenty of sc clear scripture, which we'll get to near the end of, of the order of events where it is outlined. Because God doesn't outline the order of events every single time he talks about salvation. But there are specific places where he does give us that information. Now flip back to Acts chapter 13. And to be honest with you, I think that one, this one story is probably one of the best arguments he even has is in Acts 16 that we just read there. Like, I literally think that that's probably one of the best <laughs> of what I went through all these already. Like, and it, there's, there's kind of a, a little bit lacking on that one. Acts 13, verse number 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And this goes into the, the predestination, right, that, that argument, which I don't want to get too far into this. This is one of the ones that he listed. But again, you're not seeing here, this doesn't prove his point of being um, regenerated. It just says as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. This doesn't say anything about regeneration. It doesn't say that they were regenerated before they had faith. This goes into a different area, which I'm not going to spend time on in this sermon. But basically, Calvinists have the big problem discerning between foreknowledge and, for, and, just, and just choosing who's going to be saved and who isn't, right? So God, based on his foreknowledge of knowing the end from the beginning, being outside of time, knowing every choice that you're going to make before you even make it, having that knowledge doesn't mean that he made you choose those things. That's the big key difference. You could have that foreknowledge and say, well, yeah, these were all ordained. Of course they were. But God already knew in advance anyway. So I don't want to spend all the time on that. That's a whole sermon in and of itself. John chapter 10. Flip over to John chapter 10. Verse number 24 in John 10. I'm going to try to blow through these a little bit quicker. It is important to, to just do this exercise, though. I, I think it's something we can learn from. John chapter 10, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. So what they will take this to mean is saying, well, 
The reason why they can't believe is because they're not regenerated. That's, and this is what they're using, again, as their, as their proof text. Well, if you don't understand the reprobate doctrine, yeah, right. then this might confuse you. But when you understand that these people, these Jews that came to him and basically are accusing him, and say, well, just tell us plainly, right? He says, I've already told you. You already had the choice, and you believe not. I've already done all these works. You know, and, and it, I don't, it may not be this specific group, but you know, they, they attribute it unto Satan. You know, blaspheme in the Holy Ghost. So I told you, believe not. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Uh, he said in other places, you know, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. When you are born again, you are a sheep, right? And you're going you're gonna to hear him and follow him. But if you are a goat, if you're a child of the devil, if you're a reprobate, you will, you will not hear him. And this ties in perfectly with the reference in Isaiah where he says, um, by seeing they shall see and not perceive, and hearing they shall hear and not understand. Lest they should see with their, with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted, and I should heal them. Because there were people that were reprobate. And that's what that verse is talking about. There's some people that just, he is not going to allow them to believe because they've already given themselves over to reprobate mind. Again, that's kind of another topic for another day. But we're, we're looking at these references to see, does this prove that you have to be regenerated or born again in order to believe on Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 36, and this is one where the context really is important. I had to give a lot more context in this because he references Ezekiel 36, just verses 26 and 27. We're going to read from 22 to 30. Because this context is talking about a particular time frame that's referenced in the context. So if you just want to apply this to just every, every time, you know, to just general salvation, you can't do that because of the context. So the, he quotes verses 26 and 27. We can read those first. Where it says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Well, let's read this in context. Verse 22. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses and I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. I believe that this passage is a prophetic passage talking about future events in the millennium where he's going to bring Israel together and um, he's I'm gonna take you from one heathen gather you out of all countries because at this point was all of Israel gathered from from all countries in Ezekiel 
I mean, it hadn't happened yet, and I don't think it's happened since then, where they've all been gathered together, and God has blessed them and just given them everything and, you know, has put my spirit within you and caused you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments. When he's going to give them the new heart, he's going to give them a new spirit, I think this is, you know, not, you know, obviously it's talking about a stony heart of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. He's going to give them a new flesh. We're going to get a new body. We're going to get a new spirit. We're, well, we have a new spirit, but we're going to get a new body in the millennium. We will have a new, you know, we won't have the sinful flesh at all. So to, to use this in the context of every single believer has this happened to them isn't even appropriate. But when you read it in context, what he's talking to, he's talking to Israel. He's talking about them being gathered from the nation. He's talking about these things happen to them. All of this fits together. This isn't talking about just, hey, when a person gets saved, this is what happens to them. And even still, I, I don't see how this verse still says that you get regenerated first and then you believe. That's still, I mean, no matter how you want to slice it, it's still not <laughs> saying that. Um, you don't have to turn there. You can turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I guess I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to get through these quickly. Um, John 6.37 is another verse that they reference. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Well, that says it all. I guess we're born again before we believe. Because all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. But you see, he uses verses that you can see where they're going with it in the sense of, oh, well, this is talking about irresistible grace, right? So I say, oh, irresistible grace verse. There you go. But it's not proving the point that he's trying to make. You could try to support it for irresistible grace, maybe, but it's, this, isn't, this isn't showing... You get regenerated first, and then you believe. It doesn't prove that. John 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But see, I added verse 12, because they only want to use verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If they would have gone one verse earlier, they'd see very clearly because this supports exactly what we believe. Anyway, I mean, I believe verse 12 and 13. But it says, as many as received him, talking about Jesus Christ, you receive him by believing on him to them. Who? Those that have received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God Regeneration, being born again, being a son of God is being born again. That you don't even get, you're not even capable of being a son of God until after you've received him. That's when it happens. But they're saying the regeneration happens first. That's why they skip out verse 12. That's why it says, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So oh, no, no. So you, you think you're born again because of your own will. No, the birth that takes, I'm not giving myself a new birth. God gives us that birth. It is the power of God that creates that new spirit. That is being born of God. God does that. But he doesn't do that until you put your faith in Christ. There's nothing wrong with, with the, you know, it's not saying that you're not born again because you chose to believe. That's not what that means at all. It's just saying it's not of your own will that, you know, or of blood. It's not of any of this stuff that, that's where the birth comes from. The birth comes from God but it doesn't happen until you believe, which is why verse 12 is there first, saying you believe first. 1 Corinthians 4, look at verse number 7. If you're in 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 
The context of this passage is people boasting about things that they've learned or being a Paul or being a Paul or thing, you know, just, just, just other things of bragging about it. Or even salvation, you can't boast or brag about salvation because salvation's a free gift. But this doesn't say that you have to be regenerated first. But see, they, in their twisted mind, they're thinking, oh, well, you can brag about being saved if you're the one that chose to believe, right? Come on now. That's as stupid as saying, you know, someone offered me a free gift. Someone offered everybody a free gift. I chose to take it. See, I, I earned it. Man, I worked hard for that. I didn't do anything. I just took it. I just received it. Uh, flip over to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15. But they just like throwing anything out there just to, just to try to bolster their argument to make it sound like they have all this, all this evidence. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. And again, I don't see how this proves the other argument. To me, I'd look at this and say, well, we preached, and then they believed. There's nothing about being regenerated here. He's saying, you know, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. The good works that we do is by the grace of God. God has given us everything. He's, he's made us the way he's made us. God can get the credit for everything. He gets the credit for, for giving and sacrifices his son on the cross. He has the credit for our salvation. It doesn't take anything away from God to allow us to have the choice of whether or not we're going to accept what God did for us or not. That takes nothing away from anything that God's done. It doesn't take away from any credit. You don't earn any bit of that by choosing to receive a free gift. That is not earning anything. Humbly accepting something is not, does not take away anything from the giver of the gift at all. I mean, think about that. If you were going to give something real nice to someone, are you going to think, oh, you received it. You did something for it now. <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to make you have this because then I'm going to get all the credit giving you a gift. I'm just going to make sure you take it. You don't even have a choice in the matter. I'm just leaving it with you. It's silly. No, given a choice, God still gets all the credit. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, amen and amen. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. God gives us all the good gifts that we have. He gets the credit. It's a gift. But as with any gift, you get to choose whether or not you receive it. You either accept it or you don't. And then in verse 18, it says, of his own will begat he us. Yeah. It is God's will that he begat us. He, he, he did. We are born again through the will of God. But that comes after we believe. And this verse, or these verses, do not state at all that it comes before you believe. That was the claim that was made. None of these verses say that. None of them say that. They try to twist them to interpret them that way, but that's not what they say. You have to have that presupposition already in your mind in order to try to enforce that on these verses. Because then you can say, well, these verses don't say that it's not that way. 
because they're not giving the timing. They're just statements of fact. I wouldn't, I don't go to these verses necessarily. Well, now for uh, John chapter one, I would. That one gives some timing. We already saw that, but as many as received him, the, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Yeah, it's clear that they believed first. They received him first and then they be, were born again. Then they became regenerated. And in John 3, 27 says, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. No one's claiming otherwise. <laughs> you can't receive it unless God's giving it to you. Okay. Eternal life is a gift of God. It's given to us of God. Yeah, I know. We can't get eternal life unless God's going to give it to us. But again, this is another one of those references in parentheses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. I think this is the last one that he referenced. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's begotten us again. What's the lively hope? Well, he resurrected. We know that we're going to have a resurrection too. It's the hope we have. It doesn't mean that because we're born again, now we're believing on him. We believed on him, then we're born again. But now that we're born again, we still have hope. We have a lively hope. Hey, we know when believe that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, we know and believe that he's going to come back and there's going to be another resurrection. This is, this is Christianity 101. I don't know. This isn't very difficult. They like to, to reference, and this wasn't referenced in his thing, but John chapter 3, of course, you got the story with Jesus and Nicodemus. I use this story all the time out soul winning. John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again, where's the problem? No problem at all. Does it say except a man be born again, he cannot put his faith in Jesus Christ? No. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't be saved. Why? Because you have to be born again to be saved. Well, how do you be born again? John chapter 1. He already explained that. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to right. turn if you would to Romans chapter 10. Many of you probably already know this, but we're going to go to Romans 10. I'm going to share another scripture with you, and then we're going to cover um, John chapter 5, and, and we'll be done. We talk about order of events. Romans 10 does a very good job of giving an order of events when it comes to people being saved. You don't have to give an order of events every single time. You know, God doesn't have to give you the order of events every single time he's talking about salvation. He's already given it to us in Romans 10. He's already given it to us in Ephesians chapter 1. He's already given it to us in these places. It doesn't have to be over and over again. So you can't start giving a different order of events and applying it to verses that don't even give an order when it contradicts the order that's already given in other places. Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a true statement. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay, so it sounds like in order to call on the Lord, well, first, before we could do that, we need to believe. And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? Okay, well, before I believe, I guess I need to hear about what I'm believing in. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Okay, yeah, there's, an, there's one more step. Now we're going backwards, right? We're starting with being saved. Whoever calls, call by the name of the Lord, they're saved. Right there, unequivocally, they're saved. Well, can't get saved without believing, can't believe without hearing, can't hear without a preacher, and they can't preach except they be sent. How shall they preach that they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
Now, where does that say faith comes by being regenerated first? Where does it say you got to be born again in order to believe? I mean, this is, does a pretty good job of getting it really down. Like, like how much more explicit do you have to be than talking about the feet of the preachers that actually walk out to go and preach the gospel? I don't think he's leaving anything out in his steps here. It's broken down pretty straightforward. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 12. Turn if you go to John chapter 5, the last place I have you turn. Ephesians 1, 12 says that we, should be, uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God's seal of the Holy Ghost came after believing. Not before, after. But you need the Holy Spirit in order to believe because you can't do anything of yourself because you're dead. You fool. You're denying clear scripture. John 5, 24, my favorite verse when I go out soul winning. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Very clear. You hear the word, you believe, you're saved. Right? I'm not going to belabor that point. But when we continue on in John chapter 5, we're going to see the story of Lazarus. Because this is what they love to use as their, their big key illustration. Let's keep reading here, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I believe that the, the story of Lazarus being called out of the grave is a picture of the resurrection. Because guess what? That's actually what happened. Lazarus wasn't being saved when he was called out of the grave, but he was resurrected. Jesus called forth, Lazarus, come forth. And he came out of the grave. What's being described in John chapter 5? The resurrection of the dead. Isn't it funny how everything that is stating right here is mirroring what was happening in that story? If you're familiar with the story, I didn't, we didn't read it, but if you're familiar with the story with Jesus and Lazarus and, and raising Lazarus from the dead. He was dead and he called him forth and he resurrected, came back to life and came out of the grave. This is not a picture of salvation. Now, you might have some truths about salvation. You want to try to, to you know, correlate to that. But I think the main picture there is the resurrection. So even just trying to use... See, they're starting off with this very faulty application as kind of their main... I mean, that's their main illustration. That's how they hook you into thinking, oh, well, that kind of makes sense with this story. I'm saying, oh, okay, well, yeah, I mean, Jesus, when, when Lazarus, because they get you down that path before you even have time to think about it. Oh, okay, well, yeah, he was dead. I mean, he couldn't, you know, there had to be something that, that caused him to come to life. And they make that false application of just, well, you're dead when, in your sins when, when God calls you to be saved. So unless there's some miraculous event, you can't be saved. Yeah, except that that picture of Lazarus isn't about being saved. It's not about God regenerating your body and then you're able to come forth and, and hear, heed the call. It's he came forth because Jesus Christ commanded at the resurrection, which everybody, 
there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust at the second resurrection and everyone's going to come forth. And it doesn't mean that those that are in hell that are resurrected are saved now because they heeded the call. They came forth, right? No. Watch out for the, for the deceitfulness in Calvinism. And it, it really is just blasphemous. Ultimately, what they're teaching is that really the gospel, it doesn't have the power to save a lost soul. That really doesn't have the power because God has to do something first other than them hear the gospel. He has to just, just make that person be born again first. And then the, the gospel is just kind of a side note because it could be anything at that point. Oh, well, I'll believe the gospel. I'll do it because that's what they're saying is that, well, you'll just, you're just automatically going to do whatever. It's irresistible. That's a perversion. That's another gospel. That is not the gospel that we believe or preach or teach. Watch out. And, and you know what? That one argument should just make all of Calvinism just fall on its head and just be like, this is stupid and ridiculous. I don't want to hear all of your baloney about, about all your five points and all this stuff because that alone, if you're saying that, that God has to make me be born again before I can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe the gospel, I don't want to hear anything else that you have to say. And Calvinism hinges on that point. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for making the gospel so simple and easy to be understood. God, we thank you for giving us free will, for giving us choice, for giving us the option just to decide what we're going to do, if we're going to receive Christ or not. Lord, you've done all the work for us. You deserve all the glory and credit and honor. But you didn't create us to be robots. And we thank you for that. I think that's an extra gift that you've given unto us, that you've allowed us to um, be able to have a will at all. And Lord, we love you. And I pray that you please help us to, to spread the gospel of peace and to help people to understand this and to um, help those that are ensnared by Satan, dear Lord, and, and help them to see the truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.